All right. Welcome to A Growing Concern. We're going to talk a little bit, actually we're going to talk a lot about climate change and uh, nuclear energy and uh, just how we relate to all that and all the changes that are coming down because we've been, you know, ever since the Inconvenient Truth came out, we've been hearing a lot about it. But uh, there's a lot we haven't been hearing. And a lot we haven't been hearing is how the nuclear industry is, is uh, circling, trying to get back up on. I think that we haven't had any new nuclear power plants put in since 76. I'm not too, 1976. I'm not too sure. But I have a guest tonight, Lloyd Marbet, who's been on top of this since, since uh, they first put nuclear energy out there, I believe. Welcome to the show, Lloyd. Thanks, Jim. Right. It's good you, to be you, back. You've been, you've been doing this since, <laughs> since what, the 60s? Yeah, I've been at this a long time, I'll tell you. I'm starting, starting to feel like an old-timer. Well, it's good to have you. you back on the program to talk about it. <laughs> now, Lloyd's got a uh, PowerPoint we're going to get into in a few minutes, but we'll... Uh, we'll it's just, a first. It's, <laughs> my first PowerPoint. Your first PowerPoint. <laughs> well, you've been working on this and I adding have. to I, it. And yeah, all. I have, I have. So, what exactly is your background, you know, w w working with a nuclear... Not with the nuclear industry. Well, I got involved in the early licensing of nuclear plants in the Pacific Northwest uh, back in the 70s and um, basically worked at that full time clear up until 1993 when uh, Portland General Electric threw in the towel on the Trojan nuclear plant. And then I have followed the issues. I've been very um, interested in, in the, uh, the issue of global warming and looking at that. And so I've stayed with it. And now mm -hmm. I'm the executive director of the Oregon Conservancy Foundation, and they kind of let me, you know, have my way on this a little bit. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Now you say that the uh, PGEs threw in the towel, but they really didn't. They tried to collect, uh, still collect uh, uh, Oh, that's still profits. being, that's right. That, in fact, that's, uh, that, there's a continuing court challenge on that almost uh, un unending since since they first tried to do it so mm -hmm. Dan Meek is uh, you know someone who I admire greatly has uh, taken on those issues mm -hmm. yeah and, and and it's good that there's someone there that can be doing that this whole time so uh, the PowerPoint presentation you're doing is also uh, something you're going to be showing at an upcoming uh, I'm hoping I've I've filed a uh, an RFP that or actually uh, the uh, e Econvergence put out these RFPs for people to do workshops. So I'm filing an application. In fact, I have to remember to to do that mm -hmm. today or it, the the deadline's tomorrow. So. Right. Well, I'm bringing that up because that Econvergence is is October second through the fourth. Right. And the keynote speaker is. Uh, Chomsky. Yeah, that's right. And, and has that yeah. been confirmed? Yeah, that? as far as I know, that's an absolute. So, yes. So I've, yeah. never, so I've never seen the man speak. I have not either, and I really um, look forward to uh, seeing mm -hmm. him make his uh, presentation. So I know you, you showed this presentation before, and, and, and it's been a, an evolving thing. And I've been working on it since June of last year. In mm -hmm. fact, I got invited to uh, an air waste management conference that was taking place in... Uh, at the uh, convention center, and I I was uh, part of a debate with the U.S. Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency on this whole issue of nuclear power and global warming. So that's what began it. They mm -hmm. they uh, everyone. My son actually said to me, said, "Dad, you know," he says, "You're probably going to need a PowerPoint presentation." And I I um, I didn't really know much about PowerPoint at that point, mm -hmm. but my son. Um, spent a lot of time bringing me up to speed. <laughs> Get, getting me up to it. Well, that's how we, we learn to teach your children well and teach your parents well. I, 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 I'm very indebted to my son. I really mm -hmm. am. So, you know, I did say something uh, at the beginning of the program, and it's something I've thought for a while, that there hasn't been any new nuclear power plants uh, licensed since 76 or something. Is that 77, true? I think 77? it is. Yeah, since Three Mile Island. That's true. But... Um, there's well, there was the 2005 Energy Policy Act, Policy Act, which I've got in in the slide presentation. Mm -hmm. We're going to discuss that a little bit because there's been uh, loan guarantees that have been given, uh, basically being given to the nuclear industry to to uh, uh, construct plants. So it's going on. It is going on. Under unfortunately. the radar. Under the, well, no, it's not under the radar. It's actually right out in the open. I mean, it, it seems like every session of Congress there is now a battle that goes on between, um, uh, for instance, the Nuclear Information Resource Service, which is a wonderful anti-nuclear group yeah. in Washington, D.C., and, and their lobbyists. And, of course, the nuclear industry is sitting right there, you know, with their 
hand out in a big way mm -hmm. and you know wanting to get a huge commitment um, from the taxpayers so that they can move forward with you know a hundred or more nuclear plants. I had a fellow on the program a couple of years ago, maybe more than that now, uh, I, I think he was a professor, but he was from the Physicians for Social Responsibility, and his whole thing was that we really can't afford it. This stuff is too expensive yes, to, and, build, to build them. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because one of the, one of the, you know, one of the complaints I immediately had about this Air Waste Management Conference panel was is that they're really, it was very uh, unevenly weighted. I mean, I was the only person that was speaking from the anti-nuclear perspective. I and I said to them, I said, you know, this is really, you know, you, you really have a, uh, um, this thing unfairly weighted, and I think you ought to bring in some other people. And they allowed me to bring in two other people. And I brought in Jim Harding, who's a utility economist from Olympia, and he did a PowerPoint presentation, which was just amazing. Emphasis I on mean, power, huh? <laughs> his emphasis was on economics. Oh, all right. And I mean, he really showed that, you know, th this investment in nuclear power is just like it is, was in the past. It's very uneconomical and, and full of holes as, as far as a lot of the assumptions that they make about, you know, the new designs and so forth. He, he really did a wonderful job. And then I also brought in Beatrice Brailsworth from the Snake River Alliance over in Idaho because right now in Idaho there are there's a proposed uh, uranium enrichment plant uh, the the uh, the French company I can't think of their name right at the moment that's operated in France and dealing with uh, nuclear waste wants or dealing with enrichment in France it wants to build a facility at um, in in Idaho and then there's two nuclear plants that have been proposed over there so you know we're not you know we're not sitting that far away from no. the problem. No, and it and, and the snake and the Columbia River you know run right right downstream. To that's us. right. That's right. I mean uh, <laughs> we're all connected. It's interesting uh, that um, this is this is something that uh, I haven't been aware of, but I've always been uneasy about. It. And the minute that uh, Obama during his candidacy said that uh, he he can't take nuclear energy off the table, he lost my vote. And I don't know right. if he lost anybody else's, but uh, at that point I realized that... Uh, he lost mine too, Jim. I, I am not an Obama supporter, and I, I you know, I am actually, he, he, I, I'm even more disappointed now that he's in. I mean, you know, I was very disappointed with, you know, his lack of firm commitment on the issues, and it's, it's very telling that, um, you know, what he is, the way in which he's handled himself since then, and in fact there's a... Uh, a wonderful photograph montage I saw here not too long ago that goes from George Bush into Obama. Oh, I mean, it's, 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 it's yes. morphs into him. Yeah, morphs into, into him. So, yeah. yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not necessarily just saying that just because you know, I'm against Obama. He's done some good things, and he's certainly better <laughs> yeah. than we've had in the past. But at that point, I realized that you know he's, he's, all, he's, he's corporate if he's, if he's not right. taking nuclear off the usual. table. That's right. So, and and that, those are heavy players, the, the, uh, the energy people. I mean, look, look what they did with George Bush. They met with him and Cheney, and, and the Supreme Court couldn't even, or it wasn't uh, the Government Accountability Office, couldn't even force them to divulge who was at the table. Right, and we have so the same are, issue now with Obama. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's unreal, um, really, in a lot of ways, uh, looking at how this thing is, uh, you know, how his administration is, trans is making the transition. Mm -hmm. Seems to be carrying a lot of Bush forward, right. which yeah. is not good. This is not good. So, no. well, we could go on forever, but you've got all this probably pretty well encapsulated in your, in your PowerPoint. So. Well, I've got, I, I don't go much into Obama, but I do definitely well, right, go much into the issues that we're issues. talking about. Right. right, so, right, so this, the end of an epoch is your first, is your first one. We'll get that up and get yeah. moving here. Well, good. I'm going to lift this up get comfortable because <laughs> I I, uh, I know that it may be difficult for people to read some of this in in uh, January the Oregonian ran a very small article um, in Earth Week uh, entitled end of an epic and I start the slide presentation with that because I think it really makes the the overall point um, the article read the impact humans have made on the surface of the planet has become so expansive that scientists say Earth has entered a new epoch, the Anthropocene. A team from the Geologic Society of London made the determination after examining transformed patterns of sediment, disruptions to the carbon cycle, and wholesale changes to the world's plants and animals. Members believe humans have so physically changed the landscape that post-industrialized Earth can no longer be considered still in the Holocene.
Isn't that amazing? Never thought about it, but I know. It's, it's absolutely true. We're in a new epic. Mm -hmm. And of course, I always like this little uh, um, adage, which I think says it all. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the presentation I'm going to do before hitting the ground. The background to uh, this slide is the, the destruction of the cooling tower at Trojan. At Trojan, right. That's right. And as you see, I, I chose before hitting the ground because I think it really bespeaks where we are now. Uh, we're, we're on the cusp of a lot of really amazing changes that are taking place, some of which I think are going to be quite catastrophic. And Mike Reynolds, who, uh, by the way, is the famous architect who designed the Earthships, has this great quote, 30 years of exploration into biology, physics, and human nature have brought me to the realization that humanity has itself forged the sword that is potentially responsible for piercing its own mm -hmm. heart. I'm going to talk about global warming, nuclear power, and alternatives. And uh, those alternatives also embrace how we live. And so turning to global warming, as you have said, I think uh, the global warming debate is over, you know, about what's causing it. You know, we clearly... Unless you're Glenn Beck or... Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah I know. Like it's, it, there, you know, even today <laughs> I open up my mail and there was some disinformation that was sent to me by the Heartland Institute, which is still, a, which is that right-wing institute uh, attempting to make the case that climate change is a scam. I mean, it's just, it's, it's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think if anybody has any doubts about whether or not we're confronting global warming, I invite them to read this book by Tim Flannery, The Weathermakers. It is, a, it is an excellent book. It really does uh, provide a broad overview of the science and, and the physical evidence of what's, what's taken place. And um, I, I like what he had to say here, too. When we consider the fate of the planet as a whole, we must be under no illusions as to what is at stake. Earth's average temperature is around 59 degrees Fahrenheit, and whether we allow it to rise by a single degree or five degrees will decide the fate of hundreds of species and most probably billions of people. Never in the history of humanity has there been a cost-benefit analysis that demands greater scrutiny. And I, you know, again, if you have any doubts about whether we are confronting this problem, read this book. This is, there are a lot of good books out there now. This is another one, Earth Under Fire, which is kind of like a, a coffee table book of photographic evidence. And, of course, this, uh, this point that was made in this book is, is one that just kind of freezes me. I mean, there's now more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than at any time in the past 650,000 years and possibly in the past 20 million years. On June 23, 2008, uh, James Hansen, who's the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Science, testified for, before Congress that the tipping point on global warming has occurred when CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere reach, reach 350 parts per million. The current concentrations of CO2 are now at 385 parts per million. And by the way, this was as of last year, so they've gone above. Dr. Hansen testified that the primary requirement for solving global warming is phasing out the use of coal except where carbon is captured and stored below the ground. And since then, he wrote an article here in February of 2009, which he entitled, Coal-Fired Stations Are Death Factories. Close them. Now, one of the things that impresses me about Hansen is, is that here's a man who's devoted his life to gathering scientific evidence. He, it, it's, it's pretty amazing for a scientist to make, to, to make this kind, these kinds of comments unless there is just overwhelming, they're just confronting overwhelming evidence that mm -hmm. needs to be addressed by us all. Mm -hmm. And not only that, and this is the thing about what I got in the mail today, he also said that CEOs of these large energy companies are guilty of crimes against humanity if they continue to dispute what is understood scientifically and to fund contrarians and if they push us past tipping points that end up destroying many species on the planet and having a huge impact 
on humanity itself. And that's where we're at now. I mean, these people are still in business. And really, I think, I th I think the problem that we're confronting, at least as I've read more, and I don't discuss everything that I've read here in, in this presentation, but I think the crisis that we're coming on is going to be much worse than what is being projected now from the scientific models that have been done. Mm -hmm. I've often thought that, uh, you know, considering what's going on in our country, that it's, that it's really treason because we're putting our country at risk. But, you know, it's even larger than that. It's, right. it's, what, you, it's what you said. It's crimes against humanity. Well, the, the, you know, the, I sat down and, and, att and attempted to make this table that um, lists the impacts that we're, we're facing. Um, and I separated it between land, ocean, and atmosphere. And under land, of course, we're, we're seeing flooding, droughts and fires. Um, um, Australia comes to mind. They've had this extended drought, which is just devastating. Mm -hmm. Of course, California well, comes Texas to mind. Texas, too. That's right. Yeah. Landslides, loss of topsoil, desertification, melting ice caps, the glaciers, melting permafrost. You'll see a little bit more on this. Habitat degradation, species extinction, spread of disease, and environmental refugees. All of this is beginning to happen. Oh, the, in the ocean, we're seeing the rising of the sea level. That's confirmed. Altering of the thermal haline circulation, the Gulf Stream, which is what that, that graphic to the right is, is the, uh, mm. the earth and how that works. That, of course, is, the, is a determinant of weather and the, the shifting of, of the heat load that's in the ocean and so right. forth. Right. It, it, it cools the lower latitudes right. and heats the upper latitudes a little. Yeah. Going to have decreased carbon absorption of the ocean because the ocean just is becoming, uh, it can't take any more of the carbon that we've put in. The, and, and other things are putting in. Increased water temperature, the melting of the clathrates of methane, that's a positive feedback which is having negative consequences because as, the, as we melt the Arctic um, and, and these clathrates, which are frozen deposits of methane, are melted, then that increases global warming because the methane is much more of a, a f efficient global warming gas than carbon 20 is. 20 to 1 or something Oh, like it's, that. it's yeah. amazing. Ocean acidification, habitat degradation, loss of the coral reefs. There's all kinds of articles that would come out on that. Loss of fisheries. And then when you look at the atmosphere, we've got the buildup of greenhouse gases. Um, the, the current concentration, which is 385 parts per million, is almost 100, over 100 uh, parts per million more than what it was before we started up all those machines. I mean, our machinery, in essence, is what has made the difference here. Weather modification, of course, comes in the atmosphere and intense weather events. Now, this is an article. I tried to throw in some articles that, are, that kind of point to some of the most recent information. This is July. This is a media release from the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. They have new research that shows that the amount of carbon stored in frozen soils at high latitudes is double the previous estimates and could, if emitted, as carbon dioxide and methane, lead to a significant increase in global temperatures by the end of this century. These, this evidence is the hidden um, tipping point that, that takes us even to a, a greater level of catastrophe than what we are currently modeling. Those, these are the kinds of problems that we confront. And this is an article that just appeared in the Eugene Register Guard on August the 4th, I mean, you know, several days ago. Um, sea levels are estimated, and by the way, this, is, this, is, this estimate of sea levels is, is not worst case, but sea levels are estimated, est estimated to rise a foot and a half over the next century, which will result in fierce winter storms and mammoth waves that the state's fragile shoreline can't rebuff. Riprap and seawalls already line parts of the coast to ward off strong wave action, but they tend to shift the energy elsewhere and scour the beach in front of the structures of sand. State geologists estimate that the beaches of Oregon could erode between 33 and 66 feet due to rising sea levels alone. And, of course, that... You know, one of the things that also is going on, and I'm not going to get into this great, but, you know, we're on a subduction zone on the coast. Mm -hmm. And because the plate, the tectonic plates are locked, the coast is being also pushed up. If we have the subduction zone earthquake that's predicted to happen, we're going to have a cataclysmic subsidence of the earth and this increased rise in sea level just worsens the situation. Mm-hmm. 
the Environmental Defense Fund put together this uh, wonderful list of facts, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into this in great depth. I'm just going to try and pull, up, pull out a few things that we might want to look at. If anybody's interested, you can get a hold of me at the, at the email contact of the Conservancy Foundation, and I'll send you a copy of this. Um, we printed this up in color, no less, so if anybody wants to have a copy, there is one change that's been made to this um, uh, uh, list of numbers, uh, you know, and this is kind of interesting. I mean, like, for instance, the increase in global carbon dioxide emissions from the burning of fossil fuels since the Kyoto Protocol was signed in 1992 has been 35%. Kyoto has not reduced the uh, emissions of carbon into the atmosphere, even though that was the thrust of it. Of course, we know why. The Bush administration, <laughs> everyone has done what they could to thwart it. Um, the average concentration now of carbon dioxide, we've talked about that, is 385 parts per million. Here, the highest concentration that was measured in May was 388 parts per million. Um, the, th these two statistics are something to think about. The length of time that carbon dioxide stays in the Earth's atmosphere before it's absorbed into carbon sinks is 50 to 200 years. So which, by the way, points to one of the fallacies of the legislation that's currently circulating. We're going to talk about that, the one that, that bill that passed the House. Because, you know, what it, what it fails to do is stop the release of carbon now. It puts it off. And as we add all this, what we're doing is, is we're just adding to the problem that we need to reduce now. And, we're, and it makes it more difficult as we get to get into the future. This is also another statistic that I think is important. The length of time uh, changes in the Earth's surface temperature, uh, rainfall and sea level will remain after the carbon dioxide emissions are completely stopped. And that's projected to be a thousand years. So the changes that we're making are something that we're visiting upon our children's 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 children. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. And of course, I'm going to jump to the arrow because I put this in here. You know, I'm a big proponent of campaign finance reform. And one of the reasons why we, in all issues that we talk about, and you talk about all the issues, you know, is the, is the fact that we have an elect, a, a corporate democracy, a corporatized democracy that no longer responds to the needs of the people. And last year, just in the first six months of 2008, the coal and oil industry spent $427 million lobbying Congress to make sure that nothing happens on global warming. They're doing it on health care. You know, it, it, it's across the board. And so it's one of the reasons why I have reached the conclusion that one of the most important things we can do is enact campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. We need to take back democracy if we have to begin to have any hope of addressing any of these issues. And they're, they're collecting signatures again here in the state to do that's that. That's right. That's right. We're doing it again. Oh, I see we're back on the screen. Yeah, here. right. <laughs> I hope we're going to bring up this next slide. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Well, this is it. The, this is the most recent piece of legislation that passed uh, the House, uh, Congress on the federal level, the American Clean Energy and Security Act of 2009. It's uh, known as, otherwise known as the Markley, Waxman-Markley Bill. And, you know, uh, there's been... There's been opponents of this bill. I'm an opponent of this bill, even though there, there are, again, environmental organizations that have come out in support because anything's better than nothing. I'm not an anything is better than nothing kind of lesser person. Lesser two evil type. No, I, I'm, I've, I've given up on this too, lesser two evil stuff. I think, especially when you're confronting a crisis. I mean, you know, if your house was on fire, you wouldn't sit around making a case that part of the house could burn down. It's okay, burn, and, and I'll, I'll or, or, you know, you, you don't have to save all of my family. You can just save one of my fam family members. I mean, it's just crazy. And, and that's the kind of thing we're confronting here. And th this is a, a list of the problems with this bill. And you begin to see w what, what's happening to us. Uh, the overall targets are too weak. They want to hold us at 450 parts per million of carbon. That's way too high. They're now saying it should go down to 350, many scientists are. The offsets under the cap and trade, which is, uh, as you notice, is the casino carbon market, you know, which is going to be manipulated just like Wall Street, mm -hmm. um, under, under, it will undercut the emission reductions. So in fact, it's kind of like um, a sleight of hand. It makes it look like we're reducing carbon levels when in fact we're really doing nothing at all and things are still going on as business as usual. Uh, the bulk of the emission reductions are kicked down the road. EPA, now this is another one that really 
is mind-boggling to me. EPA's authority to reduce emissions is rescinded. Yeah, you know? I always wondered, what, why did they put that in there? <laughs> well, I know why they put it yeah, in there. Yeah, they put it in there. Why are they right? allowing it to be in there? Yeah, right. It's outrageous because what if we're wrong? What if this piece of legislation is, 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 is as bad as everyone says it is? Um, what's, the, what's, the fail, what's the mechanism that you fall back on? There well, is none. No, there isn't because you don't have any agency that can step in and say this, is, this has got to stop. Um, dirty coal and nuclear are given lifelines instead of phase out. You can guess what money is causing that to happen. Um, there's $60 billion for the carbon capture and sequestration, which, uh, which is triple the dollars for basic research and development. Again, you're always, you know, they wanna, they wanna take the conventional resources, prop them up, the kind of resources that we need to bring online, we're not seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not funding, pardon? How many pages is that bill that you've extracted? Oh, it's a huge right? bill, it's I a thought. huge bill. So and they probably it, haven't even read it then. Right, and, and, and I guess, you know, skipping forward on this too, all of this undermines the bargaining position that we have in international negotiations. If this is how we're treating the issue, what about the rest of the world? Why China. should why should they step to the plate? Mm -hmm. If we're not willing, if we're not uh, willing to to give the seriousness to this that it deserves, then we're doomed. And we need the rest of the world. We need to set the example for the rest of the world. It's anyway. like the Bush administration did, right? Well, yeah. It, well, the Bush. <laughs> well, the different. I think the difference is the thing that bothers me about this is is that the Bush administration um, clearly. Uh, was an obstruction to this. Obama, I never would have thought, would end up doing, you know, getting behind this kind of thing. I thought that this was a place in which he would champion the kind of changes that really need to happen, and yet it's not happening. It's one more of those disappointments. Yeah, well, we did get to talking about Obama, didn't well, we? Well, it's, it's impossible. <laughs> so he said he would sign this bill then. Yeah, well, we don't know yet. You know, I, I would hope that there really is, like single-payer health care, there really is going to be an opportunity to do what's right, but we'll see. And that brings us up to the next thing, that uh, the next transition in this slide. Oh, nuclear power. Yeah, right nuclear now. power. Time to get into it. So let's take so a look. So we're down to about 31 minutes, so we're moving right, along yeah, pretty we're, good. We're, we're doing pretty good, yeah, yeah. and I, I think we'll get done. Um, you know, the... <laughs> The, when you talk about the risks and the hidden costs of, of the nuclear fuel cycle, basically there's a number of subject areas that I'm going to try and discuss. One is the, the, um, the amount of carbon that nuclear puts into the atmosphere. It does. Nowhere near coal. They, they say that they don't. It doesn't. Well, that's any. not true. I'll, sh I'll, I'll show you how. Um, then, of course, there's the, the subsidies, the limited liability, Price-Anderson tax subsidies. We're going to talk about the availability of uranium. I think I'll just get into what we're going to talk about and not attempt to go through this, but we've got some areas to cover. Let's look at the CO2 uh, contribution from uh, nuclear power. Uranium mining is not done with nuclear energy. It's done with fossil fuels. So all the machinery that's used and so on, that's still, that's emitting carbon. The enrichment of uranium, same way. The plant construction, we don't construct nuclear plants out of nuclear power. We use fossil fuels again, which again, when you're talking about resources that are finite, you know, you're taking, you have this opportunity to make an investment into the future. You're not making an investment into the future if you're investing into something that's not going to work. And then, of course, waste disposal has got its carbon emissions as well because nuclear power doesn't dispose of the nuclear waste um, in, in the sense of, of doing it with, with the electricity that's produced from fissioning uranium. As far as the subsidies go, well, the famous Price-Anderson Act, which limits the liability of uh, nuclear utilities in the event of an accident. Um, if we didn't have Price-Anderson, uh, there would be no nuclear industry. They need, they need that liability. This means that if there's an accident, they only have to pay up to a certain amount. Maximum fund is, um, for each reactor accident is $95 million. That's nothing. Um, that's nothing. It really is nothing. And so, you know, you know I wish, it, wouldn't it be nice, you know, like, for instance, on our automobile insurance, we could all get a Price-Anderson Act that mm -hmm. said that we didn't have to pay the full cost of the problems that we create on the highways, but mm -hmm. that's not the case. But the nuclear industry's got a different deal. And then, of course, there's the 2005 Energy Policy Act. Now, this is a great quote from a book by Dr. Bryce Smith um, entitled Insur Insurmountable Risks, the Danger of Using Nuclear Power to Combat Global Climate Change. And he examined closely the 2005 Energy Policy Act. And this is what this act does. Under this law, 
The government could reimburse utilities for a total of up to $2 billion for the first six new nuclear plants if legal challenges or NRC safety reviews were to delay the plant's construction. As such, this law will effectively punish the NRC for carrying out its responsibility to protect the public health. The NRC will be particularly hard-pressed to justify a delay given that the government is already running a record deficit, which, which since this quote's come out, the economy's even worse. And so what we've done is we've hamstrung the very agency that's supposed to oversee how these plants are built and protect us from all the problems that they can create. Mm -hmm. Um, and effectively, uh, by, by subsidizing the industry, cur put the public at risk. I mean, it's just amazing. It's interesting with what you're saying there. So if, if they build one of these things and it screws up and it hurts a bunch of people, they only have to pay up to $95 million. But if somehow we try to stop them, uh, they can get up to $2 billion. They, that's right, they, at least as far as in the, in the phase of constructing these plants. Mm -hmm. um, this is all, these are all loan guarantees for them to get the job done. But as we get into the history of Trojan, you'll see how this can, turns around to come back to bite us. Um, Amory Lovins, who I have great respect for, the director of the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, has had this to say about this so-called nuclear revival that we're in. The nuclear revival that we often hear about is not actually happening. It's very carefully fabricated illusion. There are no buyers. Wall Street is not putting a penny of private capital into the industry despite 100% subsidies. And see, that, that, that's the amazing thing about it. I mean, and that's why they're back to get more subsidies, because, the, the, you know, Wall Street, which loves to play the casino capitalism that we're going down, it recognizes a bad investment when it sees it. Mm -hmm. They're not going to put their money there. They want the taxpayers to. And we can't defend ourselves because the nuclear industry has their lobbyists in Congress making sure that we're not getting hurt. It's just outrageous. Did the original, when the original ones were built through the what, whatever that was, 50s, 60s, and 70s, yeah. was there uh, capitalist uh, money going in? or was it part, part of the early history of nuclear power is, is that keep in mind that in the 50s when, when, all, when this technology was being developed, we were at the tail end of the, the World War II. We had seen the devastation of the atomic bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There was a real effort to beat the sword into a plowshare. So at that point, the utilities, the utilities are very reluctant to get involved in nuclear power because they knew nothing about it. And in fact, the government had to threaten them with, with oh. the idea of, 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 build, of the government building these nuclear plants and then competing with the utilities. And of course, if you remember what they were saying at the time, um, I remember my father saying it to me, you know, someday, son, we're going to have nuclear plants. They're going to be so cheap to operate that they're going to throw up the meter away. That, that actually was developed by the Atomic my Energy God. Commission. And, of course, I always used to go around and ask people, you know, when I was talking about these problems, has anybody been out to take the take meter out of your house away. since they put Trojan online? And of course, nobody, I could <laughs> never find anybody. Anyway, I developed this nuclear subsidy warning label, which I think ought to go on pretty good. all legislation mm -hmm. that, that's submitted in Congress. It has a quote from from Jim Harding, who we were talking about. Nuclear power is like a fat kid at the front of the line, insisting to be fed before anyone else and promising in exchange to grow into another Schwarzenegger. His appetite and promises haven't changed in 20 years and governments would be wise to stop <laughs> feeding him. <laughs> I don't, I haven't seen the label used, but it's what, you can have it, I won't, I won't copyright it. <laughs> Pass it along. <laughs> Pass it along. Now we have the availability of uranium and the impact of mining, and this is the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle. And what's happening, of course, is, is first is the mining, there's your CO2 emissions, and we're going for the uranium, which is basically a mixture of uranium-235 at less than 1%, and uranium-238 at 99%, and that causes the uranium to be milled. We're, we use light water reactors. It has to go to a mill. It's made, the, 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 the ore is crushed, made into a yellow cake, and then that goes to a conversion facility. Let's see if I can put my, yeah, let me put my little arrow in here. I don't know, yeah, I guess we can barely see it. Yeah. The conversion facility is up to the right. Now what happens there is they take the yellow cake and they turn it into a gas, uranium hexafluoride, and that's sent to the government's 
gaseous diffusion enrichment plant. This is again where the government subsidizes nuclear power. And the depleted uranium, what they're doing is, is they're concentrating the uranium-235 up to a 2 to 3 percent level. And then the depleted uranium, that's what's ending up in Iraq and in, 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 in weapons yeah. and munitions and so yeah. on. It's just amazing. And then, of course, the, the remaining fuel, the enriched uranium hexafluoride, is then sent to a fuel fabrication facility converted into the fuel rods, and that goes to the reactor. That's plutonium, then. That's the... Well, no, the plutonium is not in here. This is only just natural uranium. The mm -hmm. plutonium doesn't show up until the uranium fissions inside the reactor. Oh, that's right. Okay. So, now, this is a, you know, I've been looking at uh, some of the statistics on, on uranium production. You know, uranium is a finite, just like oil, is a finite um, resource. And this is a graph that was produced by the World Nuclear Association in 2004 that shows the projected uranium demand, demand for uranium, in relation to the actual production that's taken place. The little black line that's going up, you notice, is above where the actual um, um, production's taking place. But the next slide's a little better because this really shows you where the known recoverable resources of uranium are. And notice, when you look at this, the United States only has 6% of the world's known recoverable resources of uranium. So if we, if, when in turning to nuclear power, we don't free our, there's no energy independence in this. We're, we're going to have to go somewhere else after we exhaust our own resources, which we have done to some extent, um, to these other places like Australia, which has 23% of the world known recoverable resources, or Kazakhstan, now, there's a great place, mm -hmm. you know, to go get some uranium. They're busy trying to run a pipeline up there on, on natural gas. And, it, you know, it's all part of that uh, geopolitical stuff that goes on in that part of the world. And we're, of course, sucked into that war. The, uh, this, I thought this uh, statement by Rebecca Solnit um, it really, it really depicts what we confront when we see the mining of uranium. Um, and she says, when it comes to the mining of uranium, which mostly takes place on indigenous lands from northern Canada to central Australia, you need to picture fossil fuel intensive carbon emitting vehicles and lots of them, big disgusting diesel belching ones. But that's the least of it. The Navajo are fighting right now to prevent uranium mining from resuming on their land, which was severely contaminated by the post-war uranium boom of the 1940s and 50s. The miners got lung cancer. The children in the area got birth defects and a 1,500% increase in ovarian and testicular cancer. And the slag heaps and the contaminated pools that were left behind will be radioactive for a millennia. And if you don't believe me, just Google uranium mining and you will bring up all the sites where the, in, where, where the Native Americans are making a plea and attempting to spread the scientific evidence of what they're confronting in their communities. I um, I always like cartoons. And cartoons I, are the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one is, uh, you know, the man playing with uranium, and then pretty soon there's no man. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now we get to the the history of the actual operation of the plants, and of course, the the one the, the real story is the untold story of the Trojan nuclear plant, which I would entitle if I was writing a book left behind, though I think it's being used by the uh, Christian community, but I still think uh, it would make a good title for Trojan. You know, Trojan started operating in 1975, and from the beginning, it suffered corrosion problems in its four steam generators. The cause was never identified. Upon closure in 1993, the steam generators were filled with concrete and buried at Hanford. And then there was this court case that was going on between PG and Westinghouse because, you know, after all, they got sold a bill of goods and it only had a 30-day warranty. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. So <laughs> what happens, of course, is, is that they, there's some kind of settlement that's reached, but nobody can see it. Nobody can see it. In 1977, they discovered, this is now two years after operation, that the control room building walls were missing reinforcement rods and did not comply with the uniform building code. Um, you know, it, it, it's just amazing. So PG sues Bechtel. And in 1981, it enters into an undisclosed settlement 
and the court records are sealed. There's a pattern that goes on here. Now, this, these court records, were, when they're sealed by the court, anybody that releases them is subject to criminal penalties. Those records were released. In the middle of the night, we met with someone that was involved with this particular court case, and they really? gave it to us. And that's how Greg, you know, talks about this. We did that, the untold story. We did not the untold story of Trojan, but we did a video on Trojan some years ago, which we talked about this. And that's where that information had come from. It became public through this courageous act of a person that I can't identify. Um, in 1986, PG was fined $180,000 by the NRC for um, near absence of quality control involvement, failure to maintain control room emergency ventilation. Remember now, this is, this is the, an operating nuclear power plant continually having problems. And what is the source of these problems? The source of these problems repeatedly are the humans that are building it, that are operating it. Why is that going to be any different for any other nuclear plant that's going to get constructed? And we'll, we'll investigate that a little more, too. In 1989, probably the, the crux of the, of the operation now, the plant's been operating almost 14 years worth of, con and in, in that time, nobody apparently inspected the pit that was underneath the emergency core cooling system. There was 14 years worth of construction debris that was discovered in that pit. Um, it was called the containment recirculation sump pit. There were supposed to be screens over the top of it that screened out debris. They were missing. Now, <laughs> if any accident had happened, if, they, if there'd been any loss of coolant accident that occurred at this plant, we would have been toast. The pumps couldn't, uh, could not pull an, a, a, an object greater than a dime through them without destroying the pumps. And yet, there, down there, there was scaffolding, there was old wire, uh, you know, welding tips, all kinds of crap in the bottom of this thing. Nobody bothered to clean it up. Um, Trojan, um, in, that, in that year, of PGE paid, in the, in the previous year, P, PGE paid $90 million in stock dividends. And yet, the fine that the NRC gave to him was $280,000. Now, do you think that that's an incentive to, uh, you know, do it right? I mean, it's just amazing. It's to an me. incentive to pay the fines and continue what you're doing. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And, of course, Trojan shut down permanently in 1993. Um, the waste is still at the plant. And, of course, there's nothing. Nobody's coming to get it. Lord knows how long we will have this in our community. And the problems have not stopped with Trojan. I mean, we're still confronting them. Um, for instance, this is the Davis-Bessey plant in Ohio. In, in, um, in, in uh, um, 2001, in the fall of 2001, the NRC wanted to shut the plant down because they suspected that there were problems at it. And they were talked out of it with false information from the utility. Uh, the NRC had correctly diagnosed that something was amiss at Dave Bessey. They had no idea that the plant's old reactor head was weeks away from bursting and allowing radioactive steam to form in the containment of a U.S. nuclear plant for the first time since the half-core meltdown of Three Mile Island. And if this had happened, you know, here we are again, confronting the same thing all over again and a another example of how the regulatory process can be thwarted by the very people that are operating the, the plant itself. You know, there's, there's climate change impacts on the nuclear fuel cycle. That's another thing, too, you have to think about. Um, both fossil fuel plants and nuclear plants um, need water to, to, uh, as a coolant as well lots as a, of water. Well, lots of water. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And so if you're building something like that, say you build a nuclear plant in a particular location in the country that's supposed to, you know, provide us this carbon free energy in the future, global warming gets worse, the climate change creates desertification kind of uh, environment for this plant, you can't operate it. You're not going to pick the thing up and move it. I mean, you know, I like to, you know, I like to point out that with renewable energy, at least you do have that option. I mean, if something's not working, you, you can choose other locations and move components but not with a nuclear plant. Um, and, and the same thing for the waste disposal. You've got to find a place to put the waste that's, that's not going to be, uh, you know, impacted by climate change itself. Mm -hmm. And if, if the very thing that you're attempting to mitigate by having this waste, you know, creating this waste actually ends up, um, you know, creating a way in which the waste can get into the environment, you've basically got a non solution. You've got another problem that you have to deal with. Like trying to force it down the throats of Nevada who don't want it. Right. Yeah. 
Um, we well, have less than 14 minutes here. So. Oh, we got less than 14. Okay, we're doing good. All right. So anyway, we're looking at climate, and the, and you know, climate can cause problems for all you know all, at various phases of the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, the other one is accidents. You know, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in in 2003 took a look at this at nuclear at, at the idea of expanding the use of nuclear power and this is what they had to say the potential impact on the public from safety or waste management failure and the link to nuclear explosives technology are unique to nuclear energy among energy supply options these characteristics and the fact that nuclear is more costly make it impossible to make a credible case for the expanded use of nuclear power and, you know, I, again, another cartoon, I, I love the cartoons, this is that famous, we build it. You know, we build faulty rockets, faulty weapons, faulty tanks, faulty toasters, jet fighters, faulty cars, but perfectly safe mm -hmm. nuclear power plants. Except for Trojan <laughs> and Chernobyl. <laughs> yeah. And here we are, by the way, looking at, oh, that's another one. at yeah. terrorism. I, you know, I am amazed that we would suggest using nuclear power in the face of what we've gone through in 9-11. And in the, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you know, the terrorists cons contemplated or considered at one point in their planning of hitting one of the Indian Point uh, nuclear reactors. And if with, they had... With one of the planes? With one of the planes. It, tw 20 million people live within a 50 mile radius of Indian Point. It was located on the same flight path used by the 9-11 terrorists. They could have veered right into it if they wanted to and had thought about doing it. Um, imagine, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if that had happened. I think it would have been all over. But here we are in this world of endless war uh, against terrorism, and we're talking about building more targets? I mean, it's just crazy. It's the same thing with the LNG. You know, we're, we're getting, we will be getting that from uh, parts of the country that, that are uh, not our friend, right? You know, it's the same thing. We're 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 going down the same road here. It's true. And then, of course, the disposal of radioactive waste. You know, I, I'm, you know, it's it's very telling that the Obama administration ceased funding Yucca Mountain. It's not going to happen. We spent millions and millions and millions of dollars developing this hole in the ground in 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 Yucca Flats and. Uh, it, it isn't working, and they've had problems with groundwater intrusion and right. so forth. Now there is no solution. Nobody knows where this is going to end up. But they want to make more. They want to make more. And, of course, that brings up this great quote from E.F. Schumacher, which I've always loved. You know, no degree of prosperity could justify the accumulation of large amounts of highly toxic substances which nobody knows how to make safe and which remain an incalculable danger to the whole of creation for historical or even geologic ages. To do such a thing is a transgression against life itself, a transgression infinitely more serious than any crime perpetrated by man. The idea that a civilization could sustain itself on such a transgression is an ethical, spiritual, and metaphysical mon monstrosity. It means conducting the economic affairs of man as if people did not matter at all. Yeah, and like uh, Winona LaDuke said, a Native American, um, she wouldn't let her kids make a new mess until they cleaned up the old mess. Right. You know, and that, that, you know, that's saying the same thing. I mean, you know, it's ridiculous that they would continue with this. The, you know, the, the final problem with nuclear power is nuclear proliferation you know, ter gain, gaining access to that plutonium that's been produced, the enriched uranium and whatnot, and converting them into nuclear weapons. Um, the, the, the concern here is one that has, has not been mitigated at all by the, the political condition of the world. I mean, there, there is, there are, nuclear materials are missing as we speak. And by creating more of this in, a, in an unstable world, all you're doing is, is increasing the likelihood that somebody's going to play with the matches. And, of course, that's th these quotes from El Baradai, for instance, um, and also from Dr. Arjun Makajani speak to this because, you know, what we basically are proposing to do, the Bush administration wanted to do this global nuclear energy partnership. Fortunately, the Obama administration has, uh, has decided not to fund the domestic program. But 
there's still this promotion to you know introduce nuclear technology to the rest of the world and somehow we're going to control it keep in mind iran is not doing anything illegal they're part of the atoms for peace program that they, they picked up that technology it was it was the policy of our government to promote them picking it up and they had they are they're saying that they're only using it for peaceful purposes. We keep saying like we did in Iraq that there's these weapons of mass destruction, but there's no evidence that supports that in Iran. And the world, of course, keeps going unstable, and this is what it is that we're supposed to try and prevent. And I, you know, submit that we are not going to prevent this by producing more of it and, 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 and keeping that instability. So we have the bottom line with global warming and nuclear power. And I like quotes from both of these books. The Seventh Decade by Jonathan Shell is a wonderful book examining the problem of nuclear weapons. And here's what he says. Nuclear power and global warming belong together because they are both threats in which the immense power that humanity has developed for itself mm. throughout the modern age has actually reached a point in which it threatens the natural underpinnings upon which our life and all life on earth depends. And then, of course, Bryce Smith's book makes that point, too. Nuclear power is a very risky and unsustainable option for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Trading one potentially catastrophic health and environmental and security <laughs> threat for another mm -hmm. is not a sensible energy policy. Good books, I suggest people get them. And, of course, I love Amory Lovins again. And when you got one planet and you got to keep living there, you don't want to try anything irreversible. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the simplest ones are the, are the most poignant. There. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So let's get to the alternatives. We've got seven minutes got for the alternatives. We've got seven minutes. 7-Eleven. Okay, now here it is. <laughs> First, I want to highly recommend that you get on your computer and go to this website, www.ieer.org. That's the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Dr. Arjun Makajani has written a book called Carbon Free and Nuclear Free. He's giving it away on that website. You can download it as a wow. PDF file. And what he did was, is he, he sat down, and this is dated now somewhat, but he sat down to see if it was possible to create an energy future in which you, you radically reduce carbon emissions and at the same time you phased out nuclear power. And he actually, when he started to do this, didn't think it was possible and he changed his mind as he mm -hmm. began to look at the evidence before him. And let's talk about that. Some of the key evidence for him was is in order to do that, in order to meet that goal, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to have an emphasis on building efficiency. We've got to build buildings that are efficient. We, have, we can use plug-in hybrids and all electric vehicles. We can have parking lot and commercial rooftop solar photovoltaics. We can have solar thermal with storage. Distributed grid, uh, you know, the smart grid. There's a lot of uh, uh, talk about that. Aquatic plants for biofuels. This is another thing going on. Distributed hydrogen production and develop direct solar hydrogen and so forth. These are concepts that, that are, are have great potential and some of which are already being implemented. For instance, here is a uh, parking lot that is covered with photovoltaic panels. What a, it makes sense to me. You know, I hate parking lots. They're hot. You know, there's usually mm -hmm. no shade. Nice to have a bunch of PV panels on top, generating electricity, plug in your car when you're, when you're parked there, you know, or, or use the power and put it in the grid for whatever purposes need to happen. Here's a, here's a microalgae CO2 capture where they take the emissions from a gas-fired plant in Arizona and they run it through algae, literally, and create a biofuel from mm -hmm. it. I mean, it's just amazing. Well, other than politics, what's to keep uh, our government from subsidizing that rather than nuclear industry? It's politics. And, and, and there it is, the policies, politics, mm -hmm. most critical. We need a hard cap for large use users going to zero by mid-century on carbon. We need to sell all the allowances. Um, I, I actually support, like Nader, the, uh, the carbon tax. I think that's a good way to go. We need efficiency standards for buildings and transport sector across the country. No subsidies for nuclear, fossil fuels, and biofuels from food. Ban new coal-fired power plants with carbon capture. Large-scale government performance-based purchases like plug-in hybrids, zero 
energy uh, buildings, demonstration plants. The government basically sparks a lot of the, of, the, of the innovation that needs to happen in order to bring us into the future that provides us these kinds of resources. And it's done it in the past and it can do it now. Take a look at the space program. There are a whole bunch of stuff, you know, even greater than Tang that, that came out of the like space the program. Internet, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the, you know, the, 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 we have the renewable energy uh, electricity grid configuration. By the way, these slides are available at that website, so you don't, we don't need to spend a lot of time on here. You can go to ieer.org and get them. Um, another good book, Earth the Sequel, um, by uh, Fred Krupp, who was the president of the Environmental Defense Front. You know, he, this is a book, I, I, it was a fascinating read because what it did was, is it talks about all these wonderful innovations that are going on right now. Worldwide. Worldwide. Yeah. And, it, and it really does a good job. I, I highly recommend that people take a look at it. You know, I, I think our challenge here is to rise to the occasion for the, because the way that we choose to live, I believe, can stop global warming, and that's what we need to do. And, you know, it's not just technology, as you're going to see. It's also, it's also looking at the way we live, and that's why this book by Jim Merkel, Radical Simplicity, is a good read for people. And here's what he has to say. In essence, the serious practice of global living discontinues payment to the oppressors, to polluting corporations, to the military-industrial complex, and to all their subsidy brand names. Our day-to-day -day purchases, our hard-earned dollars, as it turns out, are our strongest votes for the world of our dreams. We can create change with each dollar we spend, or better yet, don't spend. A tamed appetite is the core of global living. Mm. Uh, that, that's that last sentence does it all. It really does. It really does. And then, of course, two, two minutes, I so. highly recommend people go to the, the website, www.solarenergy.org, Solar Energy International. They're great. They've, they've got all kinds of classes that they do on renewable energy. And, of course, you can buy this DVD that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio oh, yeah. did, yeah. you know, the, the 11th hour. He deliberately set the cost of this at six bucks. Go in this store and try and buy a six buck DVD. It's really good. And then of course, this is another quote on, uh, on the, the challenge of, posed by climate change. I'm not gonna go into it. The end, I will go into the, you know, Kunstler, who's the, the, the great uh, peak oil ad, you know, advocate about looking at that problem. This quote I like, people who refuse to negotiate with circumstances that the world throws at them automatically get assigned a new negotiating partner, reality. Reality then requires you to change your behavior whether you like it or not. And folks, there it is. All right. Jim, thank you. Put that, we need I to hope, put that. I hope this was worthy. Uh, oh, it was great. We should probably put that last slide up for a little bit there. Which one? The, the, the one that's the, the end? No, the one you had just now. He didn't have it up on the screen there. So. Oh, the one I got. Okay, there it is. Yeah, right there, there we go. Yeah. Put that one up for a second. We got a little less than a minute. Well, I, I, incredible. We did it. We did it. <laughs> I, I, don't you, I don't know how you did it. But that gives everybody a final count on all the, uh, the uh, uh, graphics and, the, and the, how to get a hold of you and all. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, please. You know, I, I'm more than willing to go around and do this presentation. Uh, you know, I, I'm basically a student of life, just like all of you. And, you know, I really um, enjoy whatever input people give in seeing this and also you know, learning more about how we can make the difference, because I believe we can make the difference. All right. Well, we're down to about 10 or 15 seconds, so uh, don't wait for Obama to do it. Don't wait for your, <laughs> don't, don't wait for your, uh, your government right. to do it. The, the, the last thing showed how you could do it yourself. That's right. And ultimately, that's how it's going to have to get done. We're going to have to do it ourselves. <laughs> At least we're going to have to be the ones joining in. Thank you, Lloyd. Thanks, the crew. Jim, it's been wonderful. That, that's it for now. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> All right. Good job.